we're finding out the hard way that when farmers hurt, so do we. Inflation, rising interest rates, farmers barely breaking even while supermarkets make record profits, high fuel and energy prices, supply and shipping problems, government market interventions on what and how much fertilizers farmers can use, how much water they can use, what they can do with their land, how much farmers pay seasonal workers, dodgy weather forecasting causing massive losses, bad weather causing fruit and veg imperfections that supermarkets just won't touch, so farmers dump tons of food. What a waste. Money lending discrimination from activists within banks so farmers can't get loans, skyrocketing insurance, green tape and more. Pretty soon only politicians and CEOs of utility companies will be the only ones able to afford avocado on toast. G'day, I'm Mark from Self Sufficient Me and in this video I'm going to give you my opinion on why I think farmers globally are under attack and how this affects the cost of living for all of us. And then I'll also give you five things you can do to combat the rising cost of food. Let's get into it. I'm not sure if it's complete incompetence and mismanagement or something more sinister from the powers that be, but it's clear that farmers here in Australia and around the world are getting the rough end of the pineapple. And this is adding to the incredible rise in living expenses primarily suffered by the poor and middle classes. For over a decade here on YouTube, I've been an advocate for growing as much of your own food as possible. Not just to save money, although that's always a big incentive, but food gardening in general is good for health and well-being. It has excellent educational value for us and especially if you have children, better and fresher tasting fruit and veg. It gives you self-sufficiency and independence. It creates an environmentally positive ecosystem in your own backyard and lowers your carbon footprint if that's important to you. So it's fair to say that I haven't been the best friend in the past of big ag or corporates like supermarkets. But I do acknowledge that they play an important role in feeding the masses because they work at scale, are convenient, consistent, they employ a ton of good people, not everyone can grow their own food, and in a perfect world, grocery chains allow farmers to reach more households than they would otherwise using traditional markets. However, if these corporates become too concentrated and have limited competition, like a monopoly or duopoly, their market power becomes a big worry and can be open to things like bullying, profiteering and corruption. In the USA, fertilizer prices are growing faster than GMO corn, tripling in price from $510 to $1,508 a tonne in just 12 months. That's not GMO. These price increases are then pushed on to the consumer and we pay more at the checkout. Farmers in the states are also receiving less money for their harvests, but this decrease isn't reflected in savings for the shoppers in the supermarket. In Australia, farmers are starting to speak up about what they see as price gouging by the major supermarkets. They are noticing a considerable difference between what the supermarket pays for their food at the farm gate and what it's sold for to the public. Of course, the supermarkets are defending themselves, saying that these markups are to compensate for the rise in their operating expenses. And whilst some of that might be true, when you post billions of dollars in record profits at a time when the rest of us have less money paying more for everything, such as staples like food, water, rates, electricity, and fuel, plus a mortgage, the average Joe and Karen gets a bit suspicious. The Australian government has just announced an inquiry into the price gouging issue and they've pledged to act if they find any unscrupulous supermarket behaviour. But unlike a visit to a public outback dunny, I'm not going to be holding my breath. Earlier, at the end of winter and into spring, our government-run Bureau of Meteorology, or BOM, 
as it's affectionately called, predicted that Australia was going into drought. But this summer, it hasn't stopped raining. And that would be fine and even funny, except that this information caused a slump in cattle and animal markets because the market expected there would be no grass for the cows to eat by midsummer, which in turn led to farmers selling their stock at low prices. Of course, if farmers had kept their livestock, they would probably now be chewing through green grassy paddocks. But instead, they're probably mowing it with expensive diesel on their tractors. Now, why did the bomb make such a firm and alarming announcement? Was it in good faith? Or are they a bunch of vegans knowing full well that this weather prediction would hurt cattle and sheep farmers? You will eat the bugs and you will be happy. Over in Europe, Dutch farmers are under pressure to sell up their farms to the state in an $8 billion buyback scheme aimed at reducing farming in the Netherlands by 50%. The reason for the reduction in farming is to reduce nitrogen levels overall in the country. Most Dutch farmers don't want to sell their land or cut their business by half, which is understandable, and would rather look to technology and innovation to solve nitrogen problems. Less produce means more competition and higher prices. Right now in Germany, thousands of farmers are protesting the government raising taxes and abolishing fuel subsidies. Similar protests happened in France not long ago and also in Ireland, but the truth is it's not necessarily the handouts that farmers want because they wouldn't need that if energy prices were reasonable and they got a fair price for what they produced. But the German government thinks it can all be fixed by farmers transitioning to electric tractors. It reminds me of that song. Electric dreams. It's the ridiculous cost of energy, electricity and fuel, plus high priced fertilizers and the inflated cost of water that's making it so expensive to grow food for the average farmer. And who caused this? Government policies and their actions or inactions over this past decade or two. Out of control inflation, the boogeyman that our politicians and mainstream media want us to think came out of nowhere like John Wick in a action flick. In fact, the current inflation woes was born around 2020 out of poor governmental decisions collectively around the world. You can't bring the globe to a standstill pay healthy young people a ton of cash to stay at home and watch Netflix without causing some massive economic pain. Stopping the supply lines disrupted shipping food and other commodities around the world in a major way. Add to this striking workers, failing infrastructure and a lack of security. No wonder we're paying through the nose to put food in our mouth. You can eat this end. And due to the rising cost of fruit and vegetables, people are buying less and thus they're eating less, which has prompted this warning from the Queensland government. The dangers of people getting scurvy and rickets in 2024 is a real thing. I'm not joking. People are getting diagnosed with malnutrition like diseases in a first world country because it's cheaper and more convenient to buy junk food. You can't make this stuff up. If we're not careful, the good farmers who take pride in their produce and just as importantly, their land, will get bought out by corporations hiring cheap labor who have no skin in the game. And we'll end up paying even higher prices for poorer quality food. The conspiracy theorist in me thinks that it's a deliberate attempt by elites to control us through food. But it could simply be that the powers that are running the world at the moment are just incompetent. Regardless, what can we do to insulate ourselves against the rising cost of food? Well, I've chosen five top things that I or we do here on our property to combat the rising cost of living when it comes to eating. And now some of these tips will be a bit of suck eggs to some people and others will hopefully find them very helpful. Number one, grow something. Anything will help. 
Hey, Shalom, this is the brother Abai. You're back here once again. Before I get started, like always, I want to give all praises and glory to Yahweh Bahasham, Yahweh Shah, Bahasham, Rachachachadash, the bonus to my teachers, the elder apostles of Great Millstone, and Shalom to the whole four lit. What that video in the beginning was showing you is basically Esau, the so called white man, he doesn't want you to be self sufficient. All right? What does the word self sufficient mean? <clears throat> Let's look it up. When you, when you go over to um, Google and you just put in the meaning of self-sufficient, right? The first definition that pops up is needing no outside help in satisfying one's basic needs, especially with regard to production of food. Now, it says to satisfy well, one's basic needs. What are your basic needs? Shelter, clothing, right? of food and then other things go into that medicine all right um you you can't get none of those things without going to the help of the government or these institutions and um manufacturers and companies owned by who ESO all right um another definition that goes uh that pops up over here in the uh Merriam Webster it says the meaning of self sufficient is able to maintain oneself or itself without outside aid, all right, capable of providing for one's own needs. All right, and you so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native American Indians are not able to do that. You're not able to provide your own needs. You're not able to sustain yourself um, without the help of the government and the power structure of the Edomites. Now, within anything... You can find exceptions, meaning you may be able to find a family here and there that are um, so-called African-Americans, Hispanics or Native Americans that completely are self-sufficient. They may live off the land. They may be able to know how to hunt, plant, garden. All right. They have their own shelter. They're, they're living off the grid, um, whatever. All right. They have their own natural source of water, whether that be from a well or a spring. Maybe they're living in the forest somewhere near spring. Who knows? You may be able to find an exception. But we're dealing in uh, the nation. We're looking at the nation. All right? If you so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native American Indians who are the true biblical Hebrew Israelites, and y'all as the nation of the heap, as the nation of Israel, all right, the children of Israel, y'all are all subject to being um, under this man's system, his laws, and you need him, right, to to self sustain yourself to self sustain um your lives okay <clears throat> even when you go over to the uh, Edamon online right for self sufficient it says the same thing but it says another uh, definition that I want to bring out it says capable of fulfilling one's own desires without aid of others right now a lot of our people they have desires of getting a lot of money getting fame, getting power, getting businesses. And even with that, you have to go to who? Esau. You have to get loans for a house. You have to get loans for a car. If you want to go into Hollywood, you have to go to his casting calls. If you want to play in professional sports, you have to go to his tryouts, his leagues, his drafts, so forth and so on. You want to be a doctor. You want to be a lawyer. You got to go through his schooling system, which sometimes takes 10 plus years, depending on the... Um, the career that you're going for, all right? You're not self-sufficient in no way, shape, or form. And the main reason for that, well, one of the main curses was, um, let me see. Let's go over to um, Deuteronomy chapter 28, all right? One of the curses that befell, befell the Hebrew Israelites was um, this scripture here. Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight verse forty eight. Therefore shalt thine serve. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness. So, the Lord said you should serve your enemies. The nation of Israel has enemies, contrary to what Roman Catholic Roman Catholicism and Christianity likes to teach. You have enemies, all right? Your enemies are the people that enslaved you and continue to oppress you under their system day in and day out, right? So the Lord said you should serve them in hunger, right? So for food, 
You're not self-sufficient. You got to go to his grocery stores. All right. You're not out here gardening, planting and farming. Whatever's on the shelves in his stores, that's what you get to choose from. Even if you want to go organic, you want to go to a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's, you have to go to his stores. Even if you go to a farmer's market, a lot of the people that have the money to be able to self-sustain themselves off the land are Edomites also because this kingdom was beneficial for them. Their people um, took over this land all right, and reaped the benefits from the destruction and the rape, the slaughter, the thievery of their forefathers. So even at these farmer markets, who are you buying from? Edomites. So you're still going to your enemy for the want of food. Right, so the Lord said, um, He's gonna He's gonna bring your enemies upon you, right? And you should serve uh, them for for hunger, um, and in thirst, right? You don't have no um, no wells, no natural springs that you live by. Majority of you are are compacted within the inner cities, all right, um, on living on top of each other, and you have to go to the grocery store to get bottled water, all right, or you have to drink tap water, which really that's not beneficial for you unless you have the wisdom to understand how to, you know, purify that water and make it, you know, more alkaline, such as uh, putting pink Himalayan salt, natural sea salt within it and boiling it. And then you can, you know, once it's done that, you can put some li put some lemon in it. That'll help alkaline it, your tap water, and then put it in the, you know, refrigerator and uh, make it cool. But... You know, if you're just, if you're just thirsty, a lot of times you're just thirsty, you go to one of his enterprises that set up a 7-Eleven, a Walmart, whatever, and get you something to drink. Next, it says, and in nakedness, or well, you want clothes, all right? All women don't know nothing about sewing. That's a lost um, skill that all women have, uh, they used to have, but now they're concerned with, you know, getting a career and chasing the bag and, um, you know, chasing the American dream of having power and fame, you know, they've, they've lost the way. So you don't have a woman that's sewing you clothes and, you know, has, has the understanding of fabrics, which is one of the many skills of a righteous woman is, is having the understanding of fabrics and being able to sew and make clothing for not just herself, but for her husband and her uh, family, right? Um, but instead, we have to go to his clothing companies, whether it be Nike whether it be Ralph Lauren, whether it be Levi, so forth and so on, you go to him for clothes. This is part of the curse. So it says you should serve your enemies in, hung in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, right? So whatever we want, we have to go to him for. So you're not self-sufficient, and he wants it to be so. It's continuing on the scripture, it says, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. And you can clearly Google yoke of iron and you should see who this scripture fits, right? So our people are not self-sufficient in any way, shape, or form, all right? But they have time to be concerned with, um, you know, the Super Bowl and uh, the Grammys and Nicki Minaj and Beyonce and Jay-Z, all this folly that's set up in great dignity. They have time to be concerned with everything except for what truly matters, all right? How to live on planet Earth. The Lord created you to live on planet Earth that he created, and you don't even know how to live on it. You don't even have the wisdom, right? Now, us, we also suffer from this curse too, but at least we know that, you know, we have the wisdom to understand we should be learning to get more close to nature and the, the purpose and learning what it means to actually live on Earth, all right? And to be self-sustained, sustained, you know, because eventually we're not going to be able to shop at these stores and um, get certain things because this system is going to be tied to what? The mark of the beast, the karagma, right? No man shall buy or sell without the mark of the beast. And if you take the mark of the beast, then you're going to be labeled an enemy of the Lord, right? But if you deny the mark of the beast, then you're going to be labeled an enemy of Esau. And you're not going to be able to buy or sell or, you know, live off his system, the B system. So you're going to have to be what? Self-sustainable self through the spirit and power and grace and mercy of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh And however the Lord um, helps you with that, that's that's to be seen. But the Lord intended for us to be self-sustained, all right? That's why we have something such as a land Sabbath, right? 
Let me uh let me get that over here in the book of um Levit Leviticus chapter twenty five verse two. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. So when we got the land of Canaan, all right. We went into a land, so that land had to be tilled. That land had to have seed sown into it. You had to upkeep the land. The land wasn't just going to just, you know, bear fruit without it being sown and worked and tilled. All right, we we were able, we had that knowledge back then. All right, we weren't lazy, and we had the knowledge of how how to be self sustainable off the earth. Verse three, Leviticus chapter twenty five, verse three, <clears throat> and it reads, um. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy, thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof, right? But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. So, you know, the Lord was telling us how to basically farm the land. And you give the, Lord, and you give the land a, a, a rest in that seventh year, which people aren't upholding this in this day and time. That's why the earth is bearing um, very, very little and very small quantities. And the grapes are not as big as they used to be. Apples are not as big as they used to be. A lot of things are seedless because, it's, because of bioengineering and genetically modified food because people want to find shortcuts around just tilling the land and working the land righteously. Um, verse 25, this is Leviticus chapter 25, verse 5. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thine vine undressed, for it, for it is a year of the rest, for it is a year of rest unto the land. So, you know, that just shows you that, um, you know, we, we had knowledge of how to work the land properly and be self-sufficient in that manner. But part of the curses was we was going to lose that and be subject to our enemy system. All right. And they give us what they see fit when they want to give it to us. If they decide to give it to us and they can take it away, they have the power to take it away. All right. <clears throat> your, your enemy, Esau, the so-called white man, he can take away your house if he really wants to. He can take away your, your farm if he really wants to. That's why I had this video playing in the beginning. Like, even though you have these people who are homesteading and they're self-sufficient right now, he's hurting them by inflation, raising the prices on seeds and the things that they need to tend to their farm. So it's, it's you know, it's coming to a point where even the so-called self-sufficient people of this society are not going to be able to afford to stay self-sufficient. So, you know, really, you, you just need Yahweh by Hashem, Yahweh Shai. And it's a reason the Lord likens us as farmers, us as the vineyard. Um, you know, he, the, the, he, he likens us as the servants, higher laborers working within his vineyard. Right. He, he likens a lot of things in this ministry as, you know, working the land and tilling the land and sowing good seed. All right. And bearing forth good fruit, you know. That's a part of life. That's one of the that's one of the beauty beauties, beauties and you know, um, righteous things about living on the planet Earth is being able to see the fruit um, you reap from sowing with your hands, working with your hands, um, instead of just being cooped up all day watching Netflix. But anyways, I wanted to do a video on that, bring awareness to that. Um, that, you know, Esau is even taking away the people that are so-called self-sufficient in this day and time because he wants everybody tied to this beast system that's coming, this marketed beast system, the Karagma. All right. So, Lord willing, this was edifying. Until the next time I say, Shalom.